Well, good morning. I want to say a quick uh, extra special welcome. I see a couple of new faces in the room, and I'm really excited about it. And so if you are with us for the first time or the second time today, or you're just kind of checking us out, I want to say an extra special welcome to you. We're glad you're here. We would love to get to know you a little bit more over the, the next couple of weeks and hope that you'll come hang out with us again. Well, my name's Matt, and uh, my wife Morgan is here. My kids are scattered through the room, and Back in the, uh, the kids' ministry room, uh, we have a number of them, and uh, we hope that you get to meet them as well. Uh, it's been great for us to land here at the Vineyard Church in Holly Springs. We've been hanging out here since around the holidays last year, uh, which doesn't feel like that long, and yet the holidays are coming <laughs> pretty soon. They're going to be upon us here before we know. I saw somebody putting like on Facebook this week, like, oh, only 100 days till Christmas. I was like... How do I punch someone through a screen? <laughs> here it comes. Buckle up. They're coming. Um, well, it's been great to land here. We were in a little bit of a like COVID, post-COVID uh, church search, and some of you might know what that's like, but we landed here, and it's been great to be here. A couple of the things that you might be wondering about us, and I just want to uh, introduce myself and my family. A couple of things you might be wondering about. Uh, first, you might be wondering, hey, we see Morgan here pretty much every week, and we see Matt here some of the weeks. <laughs> Well, I just wanted to share with you a little bit of the story behind that. I, don't worry. Everything's okay. Uh, so my, my, <laughs> my day job, uh, I, or day and night job, I work full-time for the fire department here in Holly Springs. Uh, I'm a fire lieutenant assigned to Ladder 14, which is our 62-foot-long ladder truck that bends in the middle. If you catch us on a B-shift day, you'll probably see me driving the back. Actually, we have a picture of it here. Leah on Thursday caught us over at Holly Ridge Middle School for a fire alarm, and I'm sitting there waiting for us to clear up. Everything was fine in the building, and I get a text message, I see you. <laughs> oh, I guess I better be on my really best behavior right now. <laughs> One of the pastors is watching me. Um, so if you see, so we work a 24-hour shift on a rotating basis. So basically it boils down to uh, I work a couple Sundays in a row and then have a couple off and then it starts all over again. So if you see Morgan and our four kids here on the weekend uh, without me, don't worry, we're fine. Um, but maybe just say an extra prayer for her because she's <laughs> the real hero here being at home with four little ones. Um, Okay, another thing you might be wondering about, you might be wondering, hey, so they've got all these kids, uh, some look more like one parent and some look a little bit more like the other. What's going on with that? We have a picture of the crew here. There's our three girls um, and our little guy. So uh, Morgan and I got married in 2018, right? And the three girls came baked into the deal, right? They came as kind of a, a package deal. Um, and I just want to share with you that uh, these girls are like heroes. These girls have been through so much. Uh, my daughters and Morgan's first uh, husband, their dad, actually passed away um, after a long battle with cancer. And uh, so we together have walked out a story of grief and sorrow and mourning. But we also are living together into a story of the Lord's joy and redemption and grace. And I want you to know that sorrow and joy and grief and, and love are not mutually exclusive, that those can all exist at the same time. And the Lord is good and gracious in the way that he loves us and walks alongside of us in our grief and in our joy. And we get to share that together as a family and as a church. And uh, I want you to know there's a word about just feeling alone this morning, that you are not alone, that there are people in this room who want to walk out these stories alongside of you. Okay, so this is the story. Harvey then came along, our little guy, about two years. He's about two, oh, coming up on two and a half now. And he kind of helped reshape uh, and reframe kind of the form of our family. We're all really thankful for him, our little COVID baby. And uh, uh, it's kind of crazy. He's actually the first biological relative that I've ever shared a home with, uh, which is wild, right? I was adopted as a baby from South Korea. And that's a whole another story for a whole other time. Uh, but we're just grateful to be here with you and the way that the Lord is writing our story and the way that the Lord is writing our stories collectively together. 
Okay, all that to say, we're excited to be digging in here at the Vineyard Church, to be putting down some roots. We really were praying for a place that we could grow, that we could serve, that we could lead, that we could be connected and be a part of as a family, and we found that here. Um, when Morgan and I met, uh, I was working at a Vineyard Church in suburban Philadelphia as the youth pastor. I was leading the middle school and high school teams and some of the college and young adults groups and uh, small groups, and... Um, it was really uh, exciting to me to connect with Josh and Leah when I moved to the area and to just kind of uh, get to know them and the story here of this church. And as we were looking for uh, a church to be a part of, then we ended up exploring here and kind of uh, coming to check it out here, I guess, around Thanksgiving last year and uh, haven't, haven't left yet. So <laughs> we're glad to be here. Uh, I'm excited to be getting in. I have a middle schooler now, which is blowing my mind. Uh, but excited to be uh, helping out with Luke and Nicole and the youth ministry here and help uh, support and love the teens and students here. Uh, Morgan and I are going to be helping facilitate the marriage group that's starting here in just a couple of days. Uh, get registered. If you feel like you could use some support in your relationship or you just need some, some help, um, and not that you have to be in crisis. Listen, this could be you're just wanting uh, a little bit of a tune-up or you're just wanting some good conversation about how to have healthy conversations or how to have a relationship that can thrive, then come hang out with us on Tuesday nights. We'd love to, to be a part of that with you, and we're really excited about that. All right, enough about me, enough about our family. We're excited to be here. Uh, we're going to look at the scriptures of the Lord today. Uh, let's talk about Jesus and the things that he has to say. All right, we're in this parable uh, this series on parables, and uh, especially uh, the parables that Jesus told. And parables, uh, I know that uh, Josh and Leah have talked about them over the last couple of weeks. Parables are, they're not exactly allegories, right? Where not everything lines up. There's not a, a hidden meaning behind every figure or action. Um, they maybe are a little bit more um, like a fable, right? Where there's a story that lines up with another story. There's, there's uh, storylines that run parallel to each other. In the Greek, right, the translation is, is parabole, which means literally to lay one thing next to another in comparison. And so what we're going to do today is look at a parable, a story of Jesus, and then we're going to lay it next to some other parables, and we're going to lay it next to the stories of the scriptures. We're going to lay it next to the stories of our own lives and look at what Jesus might have to say. Okay, so we're going to look at one of Jesus' earliest parables. This is the parable of the sower, or the soils, and it can be found in Matthew 13, Mark chapter 4, and Luke chapter 8. But today we're going to look at the book of Matthew, mostly because I'm partial to the name. <laughs> All right, Matthew chapter 13, the parable of the sower. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And great crowds gathered about him, so that he got into the boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path. And the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Then the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given." And he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables. Because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand. And you will indeed see, but never perceive. For the people's hearts have grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear. And with their eyes, they've closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. 
For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while, and when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case, a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you desire to speak to us. And we pray, Lord, that you would speak to us today, that you would teach our hearts the things of your kingdom. Father, we love you and we welcome you in this place. We pray that you would speak to each one of our hearts the exact right thing that we need to hear today. Jesus, we lift you up and we exalt you above all else. Spirit, would you come and have your way among us? Move in this place. We give you freedom. We give you permission to have your way. Let your kingdom come, Lord. Your will be done. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so this morning what i like to do is three things. I'd like to look at this parable. Uh, one, just unpack the parable by itself. And next, I'd like to unpack the parable next to other parables and other teachings of Jesus. And then, lastly, in context of the whole of scriptures and uh, the nature of God, the ways of the kingdom of God. Okay, so let's take a look at this parable. All right, we can go back one slide. Okay, so here then... The parable of the sower. Jesus kind of explains this parable to the disciples. He says the parable and then explains it to those who stick around, those who want to know what he's saying, because these people have gathered, these crowds have gathered from all over. They've come a long ways to see him. They've maybe heard that there might be some kind of miraculous meal that happens as well, but they've come and they want to hear from this great teacher, and he really kind of says, Something very, very simple, like there's a guy that puts some seeds in the ground, and some grow, and some don't. Class dismissed. <laughs> like, what? The disciples are like, hey, Jesus, what's going on here? You're telling these parables. We get that these parables are supposed to be like stories of earth that teach us things of heaven, but what are you trying to say? There's seeds, and there's a sower, some grow, some don't. So Jesus explains it, that there's these four soils, and each one of them has, receives the word of God, the seed, in a different way. So the first one is the, the path, this beaten down hard ground that the seed just sits on top of and doesn't have really any ability to break into the ground. And this one, he says, is the, the person who hears the word of the Lord and does not receive it at all that they hear the goodness of Jesus and decide very quickly, this is not for me, there must be another way. There's another person, there's a, a person who is the, the type of rocky soil that has a very shallow soil because there's rock and there's maybe uh, boulders or gravel, there's different uh, hard callus uh, forms underneath the surface, and so the, the soil is very thin, very shallow. It grows up quickly, and just as quick as it appears, it disappears. I can think of a number of people in my life who have uh, come to faith, uh, who have come to follow Jesus, come to be part of the church community, get really excited, really zealous, really all fired up for Jesus, um, but don't spend the time to do the work of digging into community. Don't spend the time to really allow the word of God to penetrate into the, the deep, dark parts of their heart, right? And then just as quick as they come in and they're excited to lead and serve and grow, 
just as quick they disappear in either some kind of burnout or where some kind of flare out where things just go haywire and things are 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 a mess and they decide that man this Jesus thing maybe wasn't also real maybe there's again a different way all right and then there's a, a third person there's the person who who is the thorny soil right who receives the word and grows in the word and yet is choked out by the thorns of life. It says the deceitfulness of wealth, right, and the cares of the world, that maybe uh, they grow, maybe this person is among us, maybe this person grows and, and is part of the church community, but at the end of the day, the nutrients have been stolen by the thorns, and they don't have the ability to actually bear good fruit, right? And maybe that's you, maybe that's me. Maybe there's a fourth soil. Maybe there's a fourth soil that is good. And Jesus talks about this soil, that this was the good soil that uh, the seeds fall onto, dig into the ground. They get the proper nutrients. They have the ability to grow. And then they, in time, produce fruit. And fruit, not just like, wow, you got like one little apple off of this big whole tree, but fruit that's 100 or 60 or 30 times over that's uh, plentiful and enough to share, right? And this is uh, this, the way this story, this parable is often taught, that there are different types of soil and which one are you, right? Which one is the soil in your heart? Will you choose to be good soil? Well, I've got lots of questions about these parables. I've got questions about, like the parable that Josh uh, just mentioned of the, the treasure in the, that's hidden in a field that this man, Jesus says, the kingdom of God is like a man who goes and finds a treasure in a field, buries it back in the field, goes and sells everything he has to buy the field, buys the field, and rejoices in his new treasure. Okay, I've got questions about that. Like, what is this dude doing digging in somebody else's field? <laughs> is that how he spends his days? <laughs> I've got questions about this story uh, of the sower. Questions like, man, can good soil go bad? Can bad soil be made good? Can these soils coexist? Can they be, can one or some or all of these soils be inside the same person? Maybe can all four of them exist within me? Man, let's ask some questions and let's look for some answers. I think that it's um, easy to read this story at face value. And what I don't want to make is a case that you can't take Jesus' words at face value. You always can take what Jesus is telling you at face value. He's not trying to trick you, okay? But I do also know that there, is a, there are layers and there is a, a, a subversive nature to the kingdom of God. There's surprises. There are things that as we dig, as we look, as we study, as we learn that the Lord shows us more and more of who he is and what he's about, shows us deeper truths that will help us go the distance. Okay, so let's dig into this parable a little bit and look at some of these truths and some of the things that maybe these questions could help us answer. Let's see. Okay, one of the ways to maybe answer some of these questions is to look at these stories, these parables of Jesus, side by side, to lay the parables of Jesus and the parable of the sower next to some of the other parables and look at maybe what scholars would call the, uh, the overarching theme or the, the biblical meta narrative that Jesus is trying to tell in this story. If we pay attention to the teachings of Jesus, if we look at this parable in Matthew 13, if we look at in Mark 4, if we look at the places that he's teaching this, he also talks about things like things being lost that are found. He talks about a lost sheep. If you remember the, the parable of the, the shepherd who has a hundred sheep, one wanders away, he leaves the 99 and goes after the one, right? There's another story about uh, a woman who is, uh, has 10 silver coins, she loses one, and she spends the rest of her day looking through her house, turning it upside, from, upside down from top to bottom and searching for this coin. And then when she finds it, she calls the neighbors and her friends to rejoice with her that it's been found. 
Jesus is not shy about the fact that he is on a mission to find people that are lost and to rejoice as collectively as the kingdom of God when they're found. Okay, that's a different, sto- different story and a dis- different sermon. Uh, but in this set of teachings and parables, Jesus is talking about this sower and these soils. He's talking about the kingdom of God breaking into a corner of the world and growing and expanding and coming to life before us. He continues to talk about, uh, in Matthew 13 here, uh, the story, the parable of a mustard seed that starts really, really small and grows into something that pretty much takes over the space that it exists in. And then he talks about uh, a woman who's making bread, and she takes a little bit of yeast and puts it in a whole batch of dough and mixes it until it takes over and the whole thing is ready to grow. He's talking about something very, very small, the seeds of the kingdom taking over and growing into something that's beautiful and life-giving and has uh, something for all to benefit from. See, I think he's talking about the reality that hearts can change, that good soil can go bad, but bad soil can be made good. I'm reminded of uh, this passage in Ezekiel 36 where it says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put in you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. You know, I think that the reality is we would love to know how things are all going to end, right? I think, I don't know if any of you are the kind of people who, like, (laughs) like spoiler alerts. If, uh, you know, you read the last chapter of a book before you read through the book or you fast forward through some of you, you're not my people, okay? I want to know the story, but I want the story to unfold in front of me. But I think there is a, a human longing in us to know how things are going to resolve, how things will be. And I think when we look at this passage, the story of the sower, sometimes our, an, our human desire is to know, am I in or am I out? Are you in or are you out, right? Are you the, the hard soil, the rocky soil, the thorny soil, or are you the good soil? And which one am I? And I think that sometimes we walk away thinking, oh, I'm the good soil, this is great. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness. This is talking about the return of the Lord when things are all when time is up and the Lord returns, that we are looking for it, and some people might feel like the Lord's being a little slow. Have you ever thought to yourself, man, I just wish that Jesus would come back and make everything right? <laughs> right? But the Lord is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Right? Thank God that he does not say, wow, you're the stony, rocky, thorny soil, and that's all you'll ever be. The Lord says this in Jeremiah 23. He says, is not my word like fire and a hammer that breaks a rock into pieces? Man, even the hard parts, even the rock can be changed. Even the path can be tilled. Even the thorns can be cut back. But it takes some work, and it takes cooperation with the Spirit of God. John 16 says this, And when he comes, this is talking about the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin, because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer, concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. The work of the Holy Spirit is to convict us and help change our hearts, to break the the hard rock, to till up the hard ground, and to cut back the thorns that are trying to choke us out. Do you know what it takes to turn bad soil into good soil? Well, my kids, uh, a couple of them are in the room. They love, <laughs> they, I guess they watched a documentary on compost, right? <laughs> Which is an interesting thing to watch, you know? Um, but they really got fascinated by it. They started collecting banana peels and, you know, all the scraps from the table and putting them in, a, you know, a compost bin. And it's been interesting to see the way they've used some of that. Uh, We've also mixed it in with some other gardening soil and stuff. But let me tell you, we tried an experiment uh, a couple years ago to try and put a garden in our backyard, right? Uh, We had a friend come over who's really into gardening, really into, like, farming. He's got, you know, one of those 
micro farms where he's got a hundred acres worth of produce coming out of like two acres of land or something like that. Um, but he came over and helped us till up the backyard. And I think there's a picture of it. There you go. So this is my friend James, and he helped us kind of mark out uh, some rows in the backyard. But as we were digging, let me tell you, I don't know the people that lived in our home before we did. Uh, they did some weird stuff, man. There's, there was like a, a cement, like brick pavers under, under the ground, like a sidewalk in the backyard. And probably, uh, a, I don't know, a 20 by 20 square of just gravel underneath that's like a foot deep in the ground. Like, I don't know what the plan was, but it certainly wasn't to put a garden there. <laughs> so uh, this was one of those COVID projects of like, well, what are we going to do? Let's make a garden. We'll, you know, spend some time. James came over. We tilled this ground. He had this like big broad fork thing. There was no gasoline involved. It was just us. <laughs> and uh, we turned the ground over, found all this rock. And uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm sad to tell you, but that's as far as it went. That's, <laughs> uh, that's as much work as I put into it, and that was it. But my kids watch this uh, documentary on compost, on gardening. My wife, Morgan, has really gotten into gardening. And the next uh, slide here, you'll see this is what our backyard looks like now. In the same corner now, there's uh, a pumpkin patch, there's uh, beans that are sprouting, there's beets and all other kinds of, we have a whole herb garden. Uh, none of this, again, is my doing. Uh, I built the cage around the pumpkin patch and that's <laughs> as much credit as I can take. Uh, but, it, <laughs> but it takes some work, right? It took a lot of work and it took a lot of breaking up the hard soil, turning over and removing the rock and the cement and putting good nutrients back into the soil, putting good nutrients into it. Um, and that takes some time. It takes some thought, it takes some process. Um, okay, on our honeymoon, uh, Morgan and I got the chance to visit Powers Court Estate in Ireland. Uh, there's a picture of it here. Powers Court is uh, rated by National Geographic as the number three botanical garden in the world, right? Beautiful, beautiful property. Um, we had the chance to have a picnic lunch there and just walk through the gardens and see the way that they've cared for this just beautiful piece of earth. Um, and I actually was thinking about that I was, as I was uh, studying this passage. And so I emailed the um, manager, uh, whose name is Alex uh, Slazinger. You may be familiar with the Slazinger brand for... Uh, tennis balls at Wimbledon or their golf brand. Uh, he's actually the, uh, the head gardener. And I just asked about what are the qualifications to care for the number three botanical garden in the world? And National Geographic has come and done spotlights on your property. What does it take to be the people that care for this garden and the, this, this beautiful piece of property? Um, and he emailed back and said that he has a degree in horticulture, and most of the other gardeners ha are level five and six gardeners, which I'm like a level negative one, so I don't <laughs> know exactly how long that takes, but he said most of them have over 20 years of experience working directly in horticulture and, and in gardening. These gardeners certainly know how to produce good fruit, good flowers, and I would bet good soil, that a lot of their time is spent in caring for the earth and the soil that produces the kind of uh, place that people from all around the world want to come and visit. Well, if these human gardeners can produce good soil and good fruit, how much more do you think that the great gardener, who uh, the creator of all the earth in Genesis spoke in the Garden of Eden in all its perfection came into existence and came into being just at one word? How much more do you think he is maybe working to care for the soil, to care for the earth, to care for our hearts, as he says in Revelation, behold, I am making all things new. Maybe it means that he's actively tending to creation and inviting us to be part of the work. What if this God who wastes nothing, Psalm 56 says that he catches our tears, what if he takes even the fruit that has fallen off of us and uses that for the nutrients 
to, f- to feed and benefit others. Man, good soil produces good fruit, and good gardeners produce good soil. What if the great gardener is inviting you to help him in his work? All throughout his ministry, Jesus uses these agricultural images. John 15 is a familiar passage to many of us. He talks about, I am the vine and you are the branches. Remain in me and you will bear much fruit. This fruit, the Apostle Paul describes in Galatians, and I think we have uh, a series coming up on the fruit of the Spirit, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. Now, I want to remind you that these are the fruit of the Spirit. These aren't the fruit of Matt. They're not the fruit of Josh. It's not the fruit of do better, try harder. These are the fruit of the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us and reaching out towards others through us. Right. So if maybe you're having trouble with like love or joy or peace, maybe the 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 drive isn't to man, let me try and be more loving or let me try and be more peaceful. Let me try and be more patient. Right. I think we wear ourselves out with that. Maybe it's let me spend some more time with the Lord and let him change my heart. Let him work on the soil of my heart so that the fruit will be better. Man, maybe it's paying attention to the nutrients in the ground and in the soil of our heart. Maybe there's things in our soil, maybe things in our own heart that maybe need to be uprooted, things that need to be changed. You know, I was really the, I landed on this parable and on this passage because I felt like the Lord was trying to say something to me and, and work on something in the soil of my own heart. Right over the summer, uh, we had a chance to vacation with our family and my grandmother in uh, Ocean City, Maryland. Uh, Again, I'm from Pennsylvania, so those like mid-Atlantic beaches are kind of where we hang out. You can go to the next uh, set of pictures. Uh, So this is my grandmother and all my cousins, my brother, my sister, their significant others uh, in the picture to the left. Uh, This is the 10th year that we've been vacationing together as just grandparents and grandkids know skip the middle generation, Uh, but it's really a lot of fun, and we decided this year, hey, you know what, my sister, Heidi, and uh, was recently engaged, she got engaged in May, and we decided, hey, we're going to do a surprise little uh, engagement party for them, and so we're just going to have a champagne toast out on the deck, overlooking the bay at sunset, and it's going to be beautiful, surprise them, and just love on them for a little bit, I said it. Um... Ugh, I hate that line. Uh, <laughs> it's so weird, right? We decided we want to love and bless them. So it's supposed to be a surprise, right? And I'm in the middle of like cooking dinner where uh, everybody takes a turn doing dinner one night. So we're doing a taco bar and waiting for everybody to show up at the condo that we're staying at. And I realize, hey, we're going to do this toast. It's going to be great but I've got all these kids and my cousin has some kids and I don't think that the champagne is supposed to go to the kids. So man, I think they probably would really like to be a part of this. So I said to my brother, Hey, can you run to the grocery store down the road and grab just a bot, see if they have a bottle of sparkling grape juice so the kids can be part of the celebration and feel like they're, you know, part of what's happening. And he's like, yeah, okay. So he goes and gets one and everything went great. You can see the picture there. We had a beautiful toast at the sunset. Everybody's happy. And we're doing the dishes later on after things have kind of wound down. And my grandmother is helping me do the dishes. And she says, wasn't that so sweet of your brother to go get that bottle of grape juice for the kids? (sighs) I'm like, man, what do I do? I was like, "Uh, yeah, it was really sweet. It was really, I think it was great. You know, I felt like in that moment, there was a decision to be made of like, man, do I try to like, take the credit for this does it ever look does it ever work out if you try to take the credit for it or does it really just look self-serving right um is there a need in me for like affirmation or recognition or credit right i find myself i there's a couple more times during that week and there's been more times uh just often as maybe a, a helper wired as like the person who loves to help and support people that uh, I'll set someone up for success, and it'll actually work. And maybe maybe the satisfaction of just knowing that it worked is enough, right? And I feel like that's what the Lord has been kind of working on in my heart, 
and kind of like tilling and uprooting this thing in my the soil of my heart of like, hey, maybe if we take this out, maybe true like servant leadership could be what grows in its place. Man, everything worked out great with it, and I did not feel like I had to take the credit for it, but I did have a conversation with the Lord in that moment of like, wow, I need some help. (laughs) I think the Lord's working on something in my heart, and maybe the Lord, the good gardener, wants to work on something in your heart too. Maybe it's not affirmation or pride. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's the way that you speak to people. Maybe it's the way that you think about people. Maybe it's the way you think about yourself or speak to yourself. Maybe there's something in your heart that the Lord wants to change and the Lord wants to tune up in the soil of your life. And I want to encourage you to take some time to pay attention to that today, to really think about what is actually happening inside in your internal world. And so as we kind of land the plane here, here's a couple of things that we could try. All right. One, stick around, become a disciple, lean in, ask questions, listen to Jesus for the answers, right? The only way that the disciples actually understood this parable is because they stuck around and they asked Jesus, hey, seeds, soil, sower, what's the deal, Jesus? And then they listened for the answer. They let him explain the parable to them and put it in the context of the rest of the things that he was teaching, Right. This it wasn't just one parable that he told. He, he's put a bunch of these side by side by side throughout the day and throughout his teaching and ministry. And he put them in context. And maybe today is the day that you decide that the soil of your heart is ready for the seed of the gospel. Maybe today is the day that you realize, man, this is good news. This is good news that there is a God who created all things, who in one hand spins galaxies in orbit and in the other reaches in to capture my heart, right? Maybe today is that day. And if it is, we would love to talk with you about it. We would love to pray with you, Josh or Luke or any of the other leaders in the room. We would love to have a conversation with you about that. And maybe today is the day that you step into relationship as a, with Jesus and as a disciple of the way that he's doing things in his kingdom. Today maybe is the day that you pay attention. We could pay attention to the meta narrative. Look at this story that God is, is writing a bigger story than we could imagine. That he's taking little things that happen in our lives, happen in my life and your life and your life, and writing a bigger and better story together. Right? Uh, my prayer is that we would be written into the story of God. I think we often try to reduce the scriptures into finding God in my story right? What if we found ourselves in the story of God? All right. The last thing that maybe we could try today is to take a soil sample and get some help. Maybe see how things are actually going and make some helpful changes. You know, there's uh, not too far from here over at NC State. They do some pretty impressive work, and one of the things that they do as a service to the community uh, is they do soil samples. They take, uh, you can send them a, uh, a sample of the soil in your yard and they will look at it and run an analysis on it and give you a report on how things are going in your yard and what you can do. They'll give you a whole list of things that you can change to make uh, your lawn and your garden to make things look better, which is good news. Uh, again, for me, not a gardener. Good news. It's also good news because my lawn is not in great condition, but I hope it will be someday. And uh, Suburban dads, man, we have lawns and smoked meat to talk about, and that's about it. Maybe some fantasy football or some golf, right? But maybe it's time to take a soil sample of your heart. Maybe it's time to sit down with somebody that has a little bit more life experience, somebody that can help you run an analysis on what's going on inside of you. Maybe a pastor or a spiritual mentor or maybe even a professional. Maybe, listen, counseling is okay, okay? I just want to just tell all of you that this is, it's a, okay, nothing to be ashamed of, super helpful, and can help you actually understand, hey, this is what's happening in my inner world, and to sort that out in a way that can put some like helpful, practical ways of growth into order. Maybe it's time to take a soil sample and look into our own hearts of what the Lord might want to do, again, for ourselves, but also for those around us. 
right? The, the kingdom of God is the kind of place where uh, the flourishing of all things has the benefit for all people. And my prayer for you today is that you would know that, that you would know how that you being rooted and established in love would know how high and wide and how deep and how long the love of Christ is for you. Let's pray. Lord, we know that the soil in our heart um, does not escape you that even as we try to sort it out, that you know who we are, you know what we're about, you know the brokenness, you know the good parts, Lord, and you, your desire is to make all things new. Your desire is to take the things that we struggle with, to take the things that are trying to choke us out, Lord, the things that are just blocking the nutrients of your kingdom. Lord, your desire is to change all of those around, And I pray right now that we would take some time to pay attention to it. Lord, that we would hear from you about the things that you want to do in and through us. Lord, we believe that there's nothing that you can't do. We believe that there's no history, no life experience, no inner turmoil, no thoughts, nothing that's been done to us or that we have done to others, Lord, that you can't overcome. And so we pray, Lord, that you would come and move among us today, that you would teach us, that you would train our hearts, Lord, that this soil would be made fruitful. Lord, that the soil be made good, that the fruit would grow and reproduce, and that they would be beneficial to the people around us. Lord, I pray that everyone in this room would have an encounter this week with someone that they could give away the fruit of your kingdom to And we pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen.